Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery, and this will be part 2, 89. We're looking at the crucifixion of Christ. This will be part 2. <coughs> we talked about two basic reasons in our study on Sunday for the Lord's crucifixion. One dealt with freeing the human race from the Luciferian death grip of corruption that uh, has it um, in bondage. <coughs> we want to do <coughs> look at the second phase, two reasons, two basic reasons for the Lord's coming experience of crucifixion. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. <clears throat> We're going to take a look at the second reason. Romans, the 8th chapter. Verse 28 and 29. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them or the, the called according to his purpose. So Paul initially <coughs> characterizes a group <coughs> that refers to as them <coughs> that manifests specific characteristics. The characteristic of love of God and the characteristic of being called of God. Then he goes on to <coughs> more or less crystallize this group. He says, for whom he did foreknow. So this group is a group that was foreknown by the Father in eternity. He also did predestinate, conform to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So Paul <coughs> characterizes this group, this special group, titled Brethren. <coughs> These brethren have had a unique experience with God the Father. Turn to <coughs> Ephesians, the first chapter. Verse 4 to 5. <clears throat> We're putting together a picture here, which <clears throat> is a compilation of the reason for the Lord's coming and experiencing this crucifixion. Verse 4 According as he hath chosen us. So Paul puts himself in this group. In Him, <clears throat> the Him is Christ, before the foundation of the world. So, <clears throat> Paul adds to this picture of this group. And he's saying in no uncertain terms that this group had a special relationship with God the Father before the foundation of the world. I'm not saying it, the scripture is saying it. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. <clears throat> the characteristic of the group is its motivation, its existence, its total <sighs> desire centers around love for the Father. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, 
according to the good pleasure of his will. <coughs> so we find, turn back to Romans the 8th chapter. <coughs> We're going to look at the purpose of the Father. <coughs> Between Romans the 8th chapter, Ephesians the 1st chapter, we have a picture of a group that existed in the presence of the Father before the foundation of this creation that we currently exist in. Now, <clears throat> the scripture gives us an understanding that God did specific things with this group. He made specific pronouncements <clears throat> about this group. Verse 30, Moreover, <clears throat> whom he did predestinate, them he also called. The word called there means to beckon. Whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. So the Father brought in conditions of this group in which the group could exist in direct presence of God. <clears throat> he gave them a glory. He gave them a characteristic. He pronounced them as unique. <clears throat> a group called the Brethren. Turn back to Ephesians, first chapter. Make it Ephesians, the second chapter. Remember, Paul identifies with his group. He says, us. <clears throat> Verse 6, Ephesians 2. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So God the Father sovereignly called this group to himself, elevated them to divine status, and then appointed him them places around his throne. He positioned them. This is the eternal picture we receive from the scripture that pertains to this group called the brethren. I want you to remember that name, the Brethren. <clears throat> now, what we find, <clears throat> the Lord makes it known in His appearance on earth to 11 men that they existed in eternity with Him and the Father. He does this for a purpose. He wants them to gain their, comp their <coughs> complete identity. We're going to start with this principle. It leads right into the purpose of His crucifixion. <coughs> Turn to... <coughs> John. No, don't turn to John. Turn to Matthew. <coughs> Matthew 23, verses 8 to 9. He's speaking to the disciples. He speaks to the multitudes. And then he speaks to the disciples concerning the scribes and the Pharisees. <coughs> Matthew 23, verses 8 to 9. <coughs> but be not ye called rabbi. The word rabbi there is interpreted as Master, 
Dina call master. For one is your master, Christ. And all ye are brethren. What is he saying here? He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees and their pride and how in their pomp <coughs> they parade their <coughs> presence around wanting people to acknowledge them. They want recognition even among themselves. Jesus is talking to the group of disciples and he's saying, <coughs> you see how they perform, how they act. You don't do that. No one of you calls himself master. I am the master. And you are all equal. No one is above the other. You are all brethren. Brethren. He wants them to understand that. <clears throat> Notice what he goes on to say. Verse 9. And call no man your father upon earth. For one is your father which is in heaven. He's trying to let them know that they have an eternal existence. And a relationship with him and the father. And not to be caught up with the things of religion, the things of earth. He's trying to get them to understand their true identity. And he's driving this forward to let them know that they once belonged to the Father in eternity. And now the Father has given them to him to develop in temporality and time. This is consistently driven home to them. Turn to John, the 17th chapter. Verse 6. <clears throat> John 17, verse 6. He's praying to the Father. I have manifested thy name unto the man which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. In other words, he's saying, they were yours, and you gave them to me. And they have kept thy word. This is repeated. Dropped into verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. These, those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Again, he reiterates, they belong to the Father in eternity. They were part of the group called the Brethren in Romans 8, 28-30. They are brethren on earth. They have been given to him to develop. Now turn to Hebrews, second chapter. This is what's turning. Yes. Should we understand that the Lord is saying this more for the benefit of the, uh, the disciples, the apostles? Yes. Because the Father already knows all this. He yes. doesn't need to be reminded of anything, does he? No, that's for their, everything is right. for their. Do they understand it's for their benefit? No. Of course not. No. <clears throat> they won't understand it until after the resurrection. Right. Hebrews, second chapter. Verses 11. To 13. <clears throat> For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Talking about Jesus and the brethren. For 
which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Again, he repeats, they belong to the Father. The Father predestinated them as a group of sons. He made pronouncement upon them. He raised them to his level. They became his sons as a group before the foundation of the world. In time, he gives them into the hands of his son to develop. Turn to Urin Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, in other words, became human, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, that's the human race. His purpose in coming was to free the human race from the bondage of Satan. Verse 10, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain or the author of their salvation perfect or complete through sufferings. Two things, to taste death for every man, and to bring many sons to glory twofold purpose of his crucifixion. Now, what we find. When the Father sent forth the Son, he also sent forth the first group of the sons that were to receive <coughs> the benefits, we just read it, of glory. They didn't know, they didn't understand, they didn't comprehend. Jesus was consistently trying to let them know. After he resurrected, they began to understand more and more. We looked last week, we're going to go through that again, at the process of going from a disciple to brethren. Yes. Okay. So we know the sons, the, the word sons that he's using is a special type. type. It is not the word sons as angels are sons and they are builders. Mm -hmm. So we have this one that he's calling us sons. Is it the same as the only begotten son? Certainly, they're a okay. family. So, mm -hmm. now... Is it spoke out, spelled different? Is there no, any any no, difference? No, no. no Ben. B E N. Ben. Uh, and as a as a result you become in the family, so now you have inher inheritance. Yes. <clears throat> That's the second purpose. But we want to take a look at the progression to sonship. <sighs> what we find, Jesus. basically was directed by the Holy Spirit in choosing those that the Father was to give him in the earth. It wasn't arbitrary. It was sovereignly engineered by God. Turn to Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses 18 to 22. <clears throat> 
And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For well, they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They straightway left their nets and followed him. <clears throat> Going on from thence, he saw other two brothers, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. So we find Jesus supernaturally makes connection with his brethren. And they supernaturally drop what they're doing and they follow him. All 11 of these men wound up following him the same way. doesn't mean it was instantaneous. They knew him from before. He had made contact with them. Uh, Nathaniel <coughs> was under a tree. Peter is told by his brother, we found the Messiah. They knew each other for a while. And when it was time for them to give up their life and follow him, every one of them did immediately. Drop what they were doing, drop one life, enter into another life. That is what, if you're a member of that brother, group of brethren, that's what you're going to do. You're going to drop the old life. And you're going to pick up the life that Christ is giving you because instinctively within you, you know this is what you are to do. This is what you have to do. Now, having done that, he calls them disciples, which in the Greek is mathetes, which means a student, a committed follower. They are at this point living the life of disciples. Committed to the Lord, learning from the Lord, following the Lord. Now turn to Luke, the 6th chapter, verse 12 to 13. It came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called to, unto him his disciples, committed learner and follower. And of them, of his disciples, he had a mass of disciples. But he only chose 11 or 12 out of that mass. And of them, he chose 12, whom he named apostles. So he's changing the names of these that are ultimately going to become known as brethren. They start off as learners, committed learners and followers, then they become apostles. Apostella in the Greek. Which means an emissary. One who is sent forth. <clears throat> Basically, it can also mean a messenger. It means a representative. So they are now representatives. They've gone beyond discipleship. They've embraced a higher level of authority, if you will. He never calls them brethren at this point. Now, turn to John, the Gospel of John. 15th chapter. 
And we're going to read verses 14 to 15. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I commanded you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. <clears throat> he still doesn't call them brethren. He calls them friends. Now what is the difference between a friend and his relationship to him and an apostle and his relationship to him? It deals with a confidant. A disciple, apostles, are under the level of servants. Friends are under a level of intimate confidant where he's saying you're on the level now where I have bared my soul to you. You're no longer on a servant's level. I'm confiding everything in you that I have been given to give to you. That's as high as he can take them at this point. <clears throat> now, go back to Matthew the Matthew, the 23rd chapter, 8 to 9. <laughs> Actually, we just want verse 8. Be you not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. In other words, don't call yourself master, I'm the master. And all ye are brethren. He doesn't call them his brethren. He calls each one of them a group of brothers. In other words, you're all brothers. He's putting himself above them at this point. Because they haven't gotten to the point where they are qualified to be called his brethren. He's called them disciples. This is what it, the point at which they are now. Later on, he's going to call them apostles. And then later on, he's going to call them friends. But he's telling them their relationship with each other is that they are brethren. They came out of the group that the Father predestinated in eternity. He's trying to get them to understand their position and condition. Yes. Did he not tell Mary, go tell my brethren? Yes, he did. After his resurrection. He did not call them brethren until his resurrection. Right. Okay. This is the reason for his resurrection. Um, let's take a look at that. Turn to John. Gospel of John, 20th chapter. Picking it up, <coughs> verse 17. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Go and t go to my brethren. This is the first time he calls them his brethren. Go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father. Brethren, we have the same Father. He's my Father, my God. He's your Father, your God now because I have qualified for you to enter into that position. You're no longer a disciple. You're no longer an apostle. You're not even no longer a friend. You are my brother. Very important for us to understand this. And to my God and your God. <clears throat> Why? Why couldn't he call them brethren before? What was the difference? Turn to Galatians, third chapter. Uh, Galatians, the fourth chapter. Verses 4 to 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, the fullness of the time, what does that mean? When God the Father determined in His progression of master plan, it was time to send His Son and the first contingent of the brethren to earth to complete the first phase of his plan. This was the time. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. In other words, he became human. To redeem them, them, them. He's not putting himself in this. He's saying to redeem them the human race that were under the law free the human race from the grip of Satan so that the prototokos could incarnate into the human race to qualify for what they needed to come for notice what he says to redeem them that were under the law that we that we might receive the adoption. The adoption is why he had to die. God predetermined his sons. He made pronouncement of his sons. They were declared righteous, just, and glorified. They were declared <coughs> glorious to sit around his throne. They did not have the right to rule and reign as sons over the creation. Only the monogenesi, the only begotten son, had the right to do that. The adoption, Euthesia, gives those brethren full Sonship rights. Turn to Romans 8. Outside of the brethren, does anyone else become a doctor? No. No. Sixteen and seventeen. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, sons of God. Why? Because we have the Spirit of God. If you have the Spirit of God, you can call Him your Father. And if children, then heirs. And if children, 
and the third the word translated children can also mean sons end of sons heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together he came so we could qualify for the adoption if we achieve the adoption we enter into a joint inheritance with him ruling and reigning with him equally as sons over God's creation. That's why he had to die. And when he died, they qualified to really be called Hufisia, sons of God, waiting for the adoption of sonship. Now you're going to have a hierarchy of sons because not all of them are going to make the adoption. The only ones that make the adoption are those that make the rapture. But what happens to those who don't make the rapture and they qualify later on. They get positions, but on a lesser scale. You miss the adoption, you miss the fullness of sonship. Will those who qualify after the rapture have positions below the heaven of heavens or in the heaven of heavens? Uh, depends on what group you come out of. So some of them who come out of the tribulation could still be in the heaven of heavens? Most of them will. Okay, that's interesting. Most of them will. But they won't be able to uh, exit the creation. They're going to be part of the creation. Those that make the rapture become part of the creator. Yes. No longer part of the creation. What about? Yes. The ones that don't make the rapture but still go to heaven are going to be priests. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Matthew 24, verse 9. The rapture hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. They're killed, right. afflicted. Mm -hmm. Where do they end up? Uh, in a ha level heaven. Okay. Is it likely they'd be in the heaven of heavens? No. Because no. they didn't really experience that much. No. That's, That's right. what I'm understanding. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, that's right. <coughs> okay. It depends on the era that you come into, mm -hmm. the degree of punishment that exists after the tribulation because of the egregious evil the the mystery of iniquity reaches its fullness and anybody who is able to overcome that qualifies for the heaven of heavens from uh, the two witnesses to uh, those on the sea of glass to those who come out of great tribulation they're all in the heaven of heavens but before that they're in lower heavens because <clears throat> although they mart they're martyred and they stand um, for Christ, they're not counted as having <clears throat> qualified for the higher positions of the heavens. Because they didn't suffer with it. Uh, number one, they missed the rapture. Right. And number two, they didn't make the tribulation period. They got killed sometime before that went into right. the Vogue. Okay. Yes. I'm experiencing something right in here, right now, and uh, I'm going to speak it out. Mm -hmm. It's called fear and trembling. Yes. Yes. That's uh, Mr. Jones. Yes. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm seeing such a high degree that's available to me if I don't blow it. Exactly. Exactly. This whole aspect of the brethren is unique because what it's giving us is a picture of individuals that have a very high calling. If you come out of that group, then you have had a position with the Father in eternity. And the Lord, the Son, keeps trying to get them to understand that. He says, those that you gave me, those you gave me, they belong to you. They were yours. You gave them to me. This happens to every Christian. Now, the principle that we want to take a look at next, 
when the Lord incarnated in the earth, as a matter of fact, turn to Hebrews, the second chapter. Yeah. Why did you just say this happens to every Christian? Will we walk to the point that you're making? I'm saying that every Christian has this opportunity at this point. Right, okay. Because he was talking about the brethren, and I'm trying to work out. Yes, I'm saying the brethren have a unique <coughs> opportunity, but this point, at this point, everybody has the gotcha, opportunity. Gotcha, the level playing field, okay. Yes, continuing on what Mr. Smith was saying. Okay. Hebrews, the second chapter. Now, <clears throat> what the Father determined was his plan for the sons to qualify for the inheritance. And the plan that he worked out sovereignly was <clears throat> to become human and to experience the sufferings that would qualify that individual to ultimately experience the adoption. Notice what it says. Verse 14, Hebrews 2. For as much then as the children, sons, are partakers of flesh and blood. This is giving you a pre-existence. <clears throat> you were children. You were sons. Your course is that you become human. You take on flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them, them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, the human race. So what he's talking about here, the children take on flesh and blood. Well, in order for them to do that, he has to take on flesh and blood, and purify the human race from the grip of Satan so that the sons can qualify for the adoption. He hadn't died. You go incarnate in the human race, you're going to go to hell. Verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He had to overcome so that the brethren could overcome. If he didn't, the brethren couldn't qualify. <clears throat> he had to go first. And paved the way. That's why he couldn't call them brethren until after he resurrected. At what point did the apostles understand that? Obviously, after he re uh, resurrected, but when did they understand it? Probably toward the end of their life. Hmm. And they write basically things that may allude to that. Peter talks about the inheritance in the heavens and uh, the end of the earth and that sort of thing, yes. How could Mary keep a lid on that? Oh, she couldn't. So that's what I'm saying. So they, they knew they were brothers right after Mary found out. No, no, no. Mary didn't understand. She's just a messenger. She went to tell them the Lord is risen. That's all she knew. That's all she could tell them. But he told her, tell my brethren. So them, by him saying that to her, I would think would be a significant... No. 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 <clears throat> no. They didn't have... They didn't have the... They were basically at a servant's mentality. 
he tells her, don't, don't touch me. I've got to resurrect. I've got to ascend to my father. This is what you do. You go and tell the brethren that I have risen. They didn't believe her anyway. Peter, <clears throat> the rest of them mocked him, the scripture says. And they come out and they look and then they see, oh man, he's not here. What happened? Peter goes away scratching his head. But what he's bringing out is the difference between humanistic born-again Christians who are temporarily called, they understand themselves to be brethren, not of course from the predestination perspective, but from the perspective that they are born again. Sure. Brother this, brother that. But that's, sure. that's how they... They're part of the family of God, yes. And that's, that's exactly how, as he's saying, Mary would have you know, Certainly. understood that to me. Certainly. So she wouldn't necessarily have repeated the brethren remark because in her mind it made sense. She, he, he's talking about a group of men. They must be the brethren. Yeah. But when we talk about the predestinated uh, perspective, they had to be trained heavily, as we are, to comprehend... You know, step by step, the, pro the process that you're talking about, <coughs> Romans Look, 8, that's where it begins. Look, they didn't even understand his crucifixion, his resurrection. They didn't even believe he had resurrected mm. <coughs> until <coughs> he appeared to them in the upper room. But he told them he was going to be resurrected. He told them three times. The scribes and the Pharisees understood it better than the okay. disciples. That's why they had the guard go there and, and, and uh, put a rock in front of uh, the grave. He right. said, well, he said, that deceiver said he was going to rise again, right. you know, so right. let's make sure. And, uh, disciples didn't have a clue. Right. Let alone the women. <clears throat> but it's curious and the that reason that Mary understood was because she saw him. So he's risen. The rest of them, oh, yeah, you're talking crazy. You know? But it's curious that the uh, scribes and Francis says, just in case, just put that, yeah, you know, put that rock there. Well, they figured the disciples would go and steal the body. All right, and then as a matter of fact, he got angry with them about that. He said, didn't, you, didn't I tell you for three and a half years I was going to die and rise again? What's the matter with me? Turn to um, Acts. And you talk about them understanding the concept of the brethren. No, they didn't even understand the concept of the resurrection. See, um, just bear with me a moment here. And then ask uh, John. John. Okay, <clears throat> two things. Uh, John, 20th chapter, verse 19. Then the same day, this is the same day, the evening, he's resurrected in the morning, told Mary not to touch him, but go tell his disciples, tell his brethren, that he's going to go before them. He's going to come to see them. Being the same, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed them to him his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father had sent me, so send I you. And when he had thus said, he breathed on them, saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is how they become his brethren. They have the Spirit of God. No man has ever had the Spirit of God indwelling him. Let's 
So he called them brethren before he breathed on them. Yes. Because he knew he had qualified. <coughs> so should we understand that it's only at this point that they understand the significance of brethren? It's <laughs> at this point they only, uh, only understand the significance of the resurrection. Oh, okay. Then, <clears throat> uh, okay, what happened there, it took them a while to comprehend what was going on. He had to stay 40 days, turn back to Acts, the first chapter. Verse 2 to 3. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, in other words, after his resurrection, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He had to stay there 40 days before they began to get an understanding of the resurrection, the significance of how it all fit in the plan of God. Doesn't that imply that they had no teaching in that regard prior to his death and birth? No, it means that they didn't understand what was taught. John 16, he says, I got many things to say to you, but you can't understand right. them now. After I'm resurrected, you'll understand them because the Holy Spirit will be in you to okay. give you comprehension. Okay. Okay. It took a long time for them to understand the basics mm. because of human thinking. Yes. They did certainly have some kind of idea, uh, let's say, pertaining to Satan and hell. Sure. Okay. So now, Jesus comes around and says, you know, I'm going to pay for your sins in so many words, but they didn't understand it or believe it or both. <laughs> they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it when he resurrected. And they was told, Jesus is over there in the tomb. He's standing there. He's alive. Ah, oh, woman, you're crazy. <clears throat> they did not believe it. That's what they were hiding in the upper room. He got angry at him. He said, look, I told you for three years this is what's going to happen. <clears throat> it took him over a month after that to get them on course for what they needed to understand so that he could go out when the churches was formed and begin to teach the congregations about what they had been given. The only one in this whole thing that had an understanding was Paul. Why? Because they were so grounded in the Jews' religion and the, the tripe that the scribes and the Pharisees were giving them that they were programmed for that for years, generations. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so now, Mr. Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Jesus lets them know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for your sins by dying. Yes. Okay. So, um, when, he, when he does it, they don't immediately stop sacrificing animals in, in the temple. Yes, they did. The disciples didn't, go, didn't do that any longer. Uh, you, you, you read about that in the Sermon on the Mount. He tells them, well, that's over. You don't do that anymore. I am going to be the sacrifice. Now, they would go to the temple to worship God, but they didn't join into the ritual sacrifice that the scribes and the Pharisees are doing because they become part of the new covenant in Christ. They're looking for him to be the sacrifice. So they understood the sacrifice then? Sure. How long from the time he said, follow me and leave your nets until the Sermon of Mount? Uh, not very long. Months? A year? Six months? Maybe weeks. Weeks? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. 
Because remember, when he started on his ministry, he was doing miracles and multitudes of following him. Mm -hmm. And he had a, high, a very tight schedule. And the disciples had to be given instruction, instruction and understanding. They were just starting too. So the Sermon on the Mount was to give them instructions about the cost of being a disciple. Right. The thing of it is, Mr. Jones, okay, so now, mm -hmm. then the teachings is, uh, you got to share in the sufferings. So you paid for our sins, but I got to suffer anyhow still? Uh, I can see how that would be a tough teaching. No, it shouldn't, because what's being said, he would tell you. <clears throat> if you're going to follow me, you're going to suffer. And then do it as, as, with his resurrection or his crucifixion, just being a follower of him, the world is going to cause you grief. So prepare for it. That's why he didn't bite his tongue to the multitudes. He said, if you follow me, this, 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 and this is going to be what, you know, you're going to be misunderstood, persecuted not liked, irregardless, but by my death, burial, and resurrection, you'll be able to overcome it all. So they would understand everything in its place. Paul did. Paul didn't have any problem with any of that. Paul basically embraced it. Paul looked at his life from an eternal perspective. If we get to a point where we ditch the human fluff and embrace the eternal truth, we'll do okay. We'll march on and overcome the obstacles that are uh, being thrown at us because God designed a tailor made course for each one of us. On that course, you're going to have obstacles, but you're also going to overcome them. Yes. There is not one church that I know of that teaches. You gotta share in the sufferings of Christ if you're gonna share in the glory of Christ. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Jones, it's just, it's just, you know, the whole thing is not being spoken of. The no. Bible is not being taught correctly. Yeah. No, it's not understood. The Bible has never been taught. People don't understand what the Scripture is saying because they listen to men who have a, an agenda and a. Um, less than genuine purpose in what they're doing. And if you follow a man, you know, Jesus said, blind follow the blind, both are going to go over the cliff. 